the world's, the world's writers will walk through those gates. And uh, if you hang around, you get a chance to talk to them. I'm interested in conversations that deal with things that matter, that real, you know, how do we live our lives? First of all, make climate change personal in your life. The second step is get angry and get active. And the third step, and believe it or not, I think this is the most important. We have to imagine this world that we want to hurry towards. But kindness is looking at people as people and not as, I voted this, I do this, whatever it is. There are some people we will never get along with, but most of us, most of us are a complex mass of different things. Hello, I'm Ian Rankin. Uh, I've been with the Edinburgh International Book Festival basically since day one. I went as a student, as a reader, as a fan of writing. Uh, later on, I was invited to go as an author, which was a thrill. And it's a spectacular experience. It's a meeting of minds. It's a way to open your mind to new experiences, to new ideas, nuanced debate, entertainment, something for every age group. And that's what keeps me going back year after year after year. Long may it continue. Hello everybody and welcome to the Edinburgh International Book Festival, which of course uh, this time is a virtual book festival. My name is Ahdef Swaif and it's my very uh, pleasant task today to interview Susan Abulhawa on your behalf. I'm um, hailing from Egypt, from the north coast of Egypt by the sea, and Susan is coming in from... Yardley. Pennsylvania. Right, okay, this is uh, so international. Well, um, I'm very glad to be here. And uh, so welcome Susan and welcome everybody who is, um, who is here with us today. We're uh, celebrating and talking about Susan's latest novel, um, Against the Loveless World. A lot of you will, will know Susan's work already. Her first book, um, Mornings in Janine, was a bestseller and has been translated into 30 languages and um, has really made its mark um, in the field of Palestinian literature or literature about Palestine in English. It's become already uh, a classic. Her second novel, The Blue Between Sky and Water, which was also published by Bloomsbury, this was in 2015, was also an international bestseller. And now, of course, we have Against the Loveless World. As well as being a novelist, Susan is a poet, an essayist, a scientist, a mother, and an activist. She's also the founder of Playgrounds for Palestine, which is a charity that, as uh, its name tells us, is dedicated to trying to make life that little bit better for children in Palestine. And she's also co-chair of Palestine Rights, which is the first Palestinian festival of literature to take place in North America. So, ahlan wa sahlan, Susan, and it's really good to uh, share with you this platform today and to be talking about your book. 
It's my pleasure, Adaf, and um, huge thank you to the Edinburgh Festival for inviting me. And um, I wish we could, I wish we could be there in person. Um, but this is the the next best thing, I suppose. Yeah, and um, I'm just I'm intrigued. I I can see what looks like a kafia on your T-shirt, but um, it, it's. It, um, uh, it's Palis Palestinians for Black Liberation t-shirt. Great. International solidarity. Absolutely. Terrific. Yeah. Um, I was, I, I, I read your book several months ago and I was rereading it again in preparation for this event. And I, uh, I again came up admiring you um, on how uncompromising a book it is um, and it's it's really not often that one reads particularly in the English language such a a straightforward and unapologetic um, portrayal or, or or literary depiction of uh, the issues that that surround Palestine and this uncompromisingness, I think, actually stretches out into, into lots of other areas. In, the, in fact, not your central character is a, a pretty uncompromising person. And, and the beginning of the book, the description of the cube is very, um, is very in your face. So do you want to just <laughs> say a few things about that? Um, well, I appreciate you saying that about the book. Um, uh, th that's, uh, that's a compliment, <laughs> that it's uh, uncompromising. Um, I, you know, I, I don't, when I'm writing, I don't really write for an audience. Um, I really try to just um, keep a singular loyalty to the characters um, and never, never really consider who's reading it. Um, why they're reading it, what the reactions might be, um, not really considering, you know, what the publisher wants either. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I, with everything I write, I really try to keep that kind of one track mind focused on the characters. Um, but with this novel, however, um, I, I, I really, ha I did have to walk kind of a, a fine line um, and pay a lot of attention to um, what, this kind of Western gaze, um, because the book dealt so much with patriarchal structures in um, Palestinian society and other Arab societies, uh, I um, I worried about falling into Orientalist traps um, because there's you know there are so many stereotypes about. Um, Arab society and Arab men and Arab women. And um, so I wanted to, you know, of course it needed to be a, a, um, an honest portrayal. Um, but I still had that in the back of my mind. I, I had to contend with it somehow. I had to be honest and I had to, I mean, I wouldn't have to really think of any of this if I were writing in Arabic as a first language. Um, but English is the original that I'm writing it in. And so my first readers um, are, are, are English speakers. So, um, you know, whether, whether I succeeded or not, I, that was something that was in my mind. And I, I wanted, um, yeah, so, I mean, I, I just, I didn't want to, to give an inch to Orientalist thought. Um, and uh, I was happy that Nahed came out as defiant as I wanted her to be, um, because she was. I mean, I, I really just loved Nahed from, from the beginning. And, and as she unfolded, she, she kind of told her own story in many ways. Um, but she was. I mean, I, I think of Nahed and, and some of the other female characters in there as these kind of feminists who had never heard of the word feminism. Um, so just, yeah. But um, you also managed to surround Nahar with a whole uh, collection of women who are all um, 
they're loud and they're bolshy and they're very, very vivid. Um, and each one has her own, her own story and her own voice and uh, the character, I mean, the, the, the mother and the grandmother had me laughing out loud, but the character who's perhaps the most um, original is Umburaq, the Iraqi exile in, in Kuwait. And, um, and you pulled off something very, very strong there where you actually made her a lovable character despite everything. How did Umburaq happen? So um, yeah, I I really loved Umburak too, and she's um, uh, so Umburak. Um, just for context, is the woman who um, uh, pushes Nahar into uh, sex work, and you know you kind of despise her in the beginning. She seems like a you know a really horrible person, but. Um, you know, as the story unfolds, we get to know Umburak more, and um, hopefully by the end, uh, you know, you we also love Umburak um, because Nahar actually um, loves her, and and uh, through the course of the story, they form uh, this very profound friendship uh, that um, that's very uh, uh, that's redemptive for for both of them in, in many ways. And you know, contrary to this um, sort of Western stereotype of Arab women and especially Arab matriarchs, um, as you know, Ahadaf, I mean, I don't really know any I've never had any women in my life who who sort of were, you know, kind of, submissive and yeah. meek and, and whatnot. And, and I have a huge family of women, you know, <laughs> um, lots of aunts and, and uh, grandmothers and, and cousins and all women and all very, um, all very different, but none really sort of subscribing to that um, or, or coming anywhere near that the stereotype that the West has about us. So um, of course it's very natural that the, the women would be who they are and what they are in this story because that's that's how they are in our in our world um but i think you know it uh even in my previous books i remember one time um a reporter in the netherlands asked me and she was she was a bit astonished that there were five women and all of them were very different <laughs> from each other you know um <laughs> right <laughs> yeah yeah. Because there is that there, there is that image of what the world is like. Yeah. Yes, well, um, that that rang absolutely true. That just um, it, it was so like I'd met these women, you know, I'd met these women before, and it was brilliant to to see them um, on the page. But I also actually, I mean, the women come through loud and clear, but. But I thought the way that you dealt with the men was uh, was quite beautiful, actually. Um, I mean, even though we have some absolutely horrible specimens in uh, in Nahar's sort of the first chapter, as it were, of Nahar's life. Actually, I sort of was so eager to get talking with you that I neglected to kind of just tell our viewers something about what the book is about, um, and without wanting to. Uh, sort of spoil it for them or anything. Um, this is this is a book about a young Palestinian woman brought up as so many Palestinian refugees uh, were in Kuwait, so that Kuwait is the home that she knows. But she and her family are refugees there, and then um, Saddam Hussein's invasion of Kuwait happens, and they have to leave, and the story follows the trajectory of of her life and. Perhaps in a way, um, her finding herself together with finding Palestine, but it's um, it's very individually and very very beautifully done actually, and I strongly encourage everybody to read it. So um, I was saying that I thought that the men came through um, in a very in a very human way and in a very understanding way. Um, and but I also felt that they were all 
um, I mean, I felt sort of compassion and I felt a vulnerability about them and that they were, they, they were either already damaged or, and were fighting that damage, or you kind of knew that they would be, that they ran um, a terrible risk of, of, being, of being damaged. So they were, they were somehow sadder characters or mm -hmm. more sad characters than the women, but beautifully and very, very lightly done. Um, yeah, interesting that, that you found them sadder. I think like, I mean, all the characters are, um, they're all flawed and they're all damaged in one way as, as we all are. Um, the men, um, uh, or at least, you know, the, the main, the main uh, male character is the, the one that Bilal, the man that Nahid eventually falls in love with, and he doesn't really appear until the second half of the book. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, he he is um, he's a very passionate, compassionate intellectual, um, and also a fighter, uh, but also very, you know. Um, I mean, he's traumatized and he's damaged by, uh, by you know, being born under and live, living under uh, a military occupation that, you know, is literally trying to wipe them away. Um, so it was, it was a lot of, it was very interesting and it was fun and it was hard really kind of um, uh, writing that relationship. Um, and and you know to to see how it unfolded, especially the sexuality, because you know not had, um, n all of not his previous experience with men and with sex had been extremely um, traumatic and damaging um, to her, and when she finally falls in love uh, and experiences. A level of emotional, intellectual, and mental, psychological intimacy with a man. Um, there's, you know, there's a struggle to uh, to reconcile that with with intimacy, physical intimacy, which uh, had never been a positive experience for her. And um, so, working with that, um, writing that was was really interesting and I, I I rewrote so much of that so many times um, those parts just because I I um I wanted to I wanted you know I wanted it to feel right and to get and and to uh to be true to what um what would happen when and because Bilal was also damaged and he was physically damaged and he 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 was broken in many ways and he was physically broken. Yeah. And so having these two come together with, with so much trauma in, in different ways, but also having a very deep and, and profound intimacy on other levels. Um, and I was really happy with how it unfolded um, between them. He's, he is a, a beautiful character. And uh, for me, he's a real, he's a real romantic hero. Um, he's he's my older. dream guy. <laughs> <laughs> he's got all the characteristics of the guy you'd fall in, lo in love with. Yeah. Um, um, so he's, he's, he's beautiful. Um, so I, I wanted to actually to sort of move on to talk about, about themes in your book. But I think that it would be really nice for people to hear you read a bit now. And so while we're on, while we're on uncompromising and all that, I thought, and I'm going to move on to ask you about, about themes of, of place. Um, and so I thought maybe you could read us something. Um, the book, as I said, opens very uncompromisingly in something called The Cube. Mm -hmm. And that is a, a place. So that can lead us into the next section. Okay. Um, so I can read, um, I can, I'm going to read uh, um, one of the cube chapters. Um, so every, the, the book is divided into sections and every section opens with a chapter from the cube. And the cube is where um, 
Nahar is narrating from. And um, uh, it's, it's, this, it's, a, it's this fully automated isolation cell. And um, she packs, you know, it's a tiny cell, but she packs a whole universe into, um, into this cell. And um, so the chapters are, are directional. So there's the cube south, the, the cube north, um, the cube east and west. And so this chapter is the cube north. And so she describes each, you know, what exists in every direction. And this is what there is in the, in the north. So the cube north. The north side of my universe is a gray wall with three protruding items. The first is a small toilet made of thick plastic, which flushes when it pleases. I tried to coordinate my body functions with its timing, but it's random, so it smells in here, which I prefer to the disinfectant they spray from little holes in all the walls. There are, there are also two electronic receptacles where my prison bracelets fasten. Two small spots blink yellow when I must insert my bracelets to shackle myself. Robotic innards in the wall shriek and mechanically grab my bracelets, locking me to the wall. Then the yellow light turns green and an ear piercing alarm goes off, alerting the guards that they can safely enter. One of the improvements Israel made was to lower the volume on the alarm. When visitors come to survey the cube, they are shown this feature to demonstrate how conditions are adjusted for my comfort and convenience. But even the best inventions for confinement and subjugation cannot account for life's resolve for freedom. These high tech shackles are meant to hold me in place with my arms behind my back but I fasten myself facing the wall to my jailer's great annoyance. I remain that way until visitors leave. In the meantime, sometimes I sing and when possible, I fart. Their discomfort gives me pleasure. In this way, the north side is both the domain of bondage and the direction for defiance. I waged my fight for writing utensils on the north wall. The guards had ignored all my requests for pen and paper until I used bodily fluids to write on that wall. In menstrual blood, I wrote, long live Saddam Hussein, and in feces, Israel is shit. They made me clean it, but gave me a pencil to keep. I won. Except for prison industry guests, Israeli law allows only immediate family to visit Palestinian prisoners. My husband is gone. I have no children. That means only my mother and possibly my brother could come. But Israel revoked Jihad's Hawiya and put his and mama's names on a visa blacklist. They cannot even enter the country, much less visit me in the cube. I have a recurring dream that I'm drinking coffee with Saddam Hussein. I am desperate to speak to him, but we sit in silence, staring at each other. We turn our cup over to allow the coffee grounds to paint our fates. Umburak arrives to read our fortunes, but I insist we wait for Jihad to arrive. Then both Saddam and Umburak point to an olive tree in our midst, and I am satisfied Jihad is with us. But the tree is also Bilal, Umburak contemplates Saddam's cup and after a moment laments that jihad should have left before, should have left Kuwait before the Americans came. Saddam shrugs and motions to my cup. I turn it over and to my horror, I see faceless men beating my brother. I seek jihad, I seek Bilal for help, but the olive tree is gone. I wake up in panic, sweat and regret. Then I try hard to get back to the dream, to rescue my brother, to leave Kuwait before the Americans come. Well, that was, um, I, I consistently found the cube passages pretty startling, I mean, fascinating, but also really startling. And I, I want to come back to the cube in another context, but for the moment, um, 
we were saying that, uh, that the cube is the, the cube is where the book opens because that's where Nahar now finds herself and that's the place from which she's actually writing the text that we hold in our hands. Um, and there's a very strong theme of, of place in the book, which I guess is not surprising, given that it's to do with, uh, with, with refugees. But very early on, um, Nahar says, but I know now that going from place to place is just something exiles have to do, whatever the reason. The earth is never steady beneath our feet. And um, that's, that's a theme that, that carries on through, through the book, yeah? Yeah, um, absolutely. And uh, there's the you know there's there's also the contrast between um, between the the places that sh that uh, that shifts that shifts beneath her feet. You know, I mean, her parents were refugees from um, first the forty eight um, Nakba and then from sixty seven Naksa, uh, and then but you know she Nahar was born in Kuwait and she kind of. She she wasn't interested in politics. She didn't really know much about Palestine, except you know that that's that her parents were refugees from there, and they're, you know they had these black and white photos from Haifa and from Anas Sultan. Um, but then she becomes a refugee when uh, you know after after the Iraqi occupation and the subsequent U.S. invasion, there was a mass exodus of Palestinians, and so she she finds herself in Jordan, and which. Um, uh, she she can never acclimate to, for various reasons. And then you know, in Palestine, um, it's you know there's she has a she gets off to a rocky start. I mean, there's something different about Palestine, and um, uh, and there's actually a passage in the book which I can read um, that sort of encapsulates a little bit of uh, of what it was like for her um, to be there at least initially. Yeah, that would be yeah. great. Okay. Um, it's very short. Um, so she goes out, um, she begins going out to with Bilal on these um, regular hikes, which, you know, Bilal is, is very much an outdoorsman. <laughs> I wasn't particularly fond of the rugged outdoors, but I began to see those rocky hills differently through the sheer force of Bilal's passion for everything they held. Most strikingly was the silence. Absent was the persistent cacophony of traffic, street vendors, pedestrians, construction, and the buzz of street lights that filled every space of our tight living quarters, both in Kuwait and in Amman. Instead, I awoke to the songs of birds and wind chimes, and I was lulled at night by the orchestra of crickets and the calls of jackals and wolves. It was disorienting in the beginning because I didn't know how to be in such openness. I found myself breathing deeply and deliberately in the mornings, inhaling the immensity of that silence. It made me realize how limited my world had been that I could not imagine the need to pack more than those house slippers in addition to multiple pairs of heels, even though I knew I would be here at least a couple of months for the divorce proceedings. My first purchase in Palestine was a pair of green and white sneakers, which I wore on my next trek with Bilal. He eyed them with a grin. Now you don't need to lean on me, he said. That's right. Pity. Bilal taught me to identify individual plants we encountered, which usually had associated folklore, culinary uses, and medicinal value. We picked wild za'atar together and, pl and plucked the occasional pomegranate wherever we found them. Life didn't grow wild like this in Kuwait or Amman. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's beautiful. That, and that really encapsulates so much of the, um, of the, the Palestinian um, section or the Palestinian homecoming uh, of Nahr. And, and interestingly, I mean, I kind of felt there's also, there's a, a passage where uh, Nahr describes the conditions under which Bilal has to live. 
because of course he had been a prisoner uh, in an Israeli prison and he had come out and and um, I mean, if, if, if I might read this, it's tiny, but it's Bilal had been released under the Oslo agreement, but his freedom was conditioned on his never practicing his profession as a chemist in any capacity, not even teaching. He was forbidden to travel outside a specified radius without authorization from the local military authority. He could not write or publish any political material, could not under any circumstances enter Jerusalem. And if he ever left the country, he could not return. So these are horrendous conditions of confinement. And yet these are the conditions within which they fight for freedom. Right. Yeah. And interestingly also that a tool of the fight for freedom is a subterranean city. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, right. I mean, the, these conditions that... Um, conditions of Bilal's release are, uh, are, are actually conditions that a lot of um, prisoners, former prisoners um, have, to, have to live under. I mean, they remain in prison even when they're, when they're released um, from jail cells. Um, but of course, um, Bilal remains unbroken and, uh, and and there's a lot of subversion, including, you know, uh, um, a, the subterranean city. Um, Palestine, as as we all know, uh, is layered, uh, is layers upon layers of civilizations. And some of those exist underground. Um, some have been found in the past. And, uh, but of course, we know uh, there are many that remain underground. And one of them, uh, uh, they do stumble upon one of those um, an underground world that uh, was inhabited by their ancestors. And it is from there that um, all manner of resistance is born and, and, um, and plans are concocted. Uh, and it remains a secret till the end, even though, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot happens and a lot of them are, you know, I don't mean, I don't want to give the book away, no, but no, no, yeah. No. No, but this is, it's, it's, yeah, that's, that's a whole brilliant uh, sequence there. And actually, you must have done a huge amount of research. And, and I would love you to tell us about that. But I, I also wanted to, to, to twin that observation with the fact that the book is so energetic. I mean, the energy of Nahar, even, you know, even as she's in the cube and even as she's tired and growing older and so on, there is a tremendous energy that actually like just pushed me through the book in, in two days. Um, and I think that's really interesting to have that. And at the same time to, I mean, you can't have just known all this stuff. You must have spent time finding out about things. Of course. Um, the yeah. cube itself, the underground city, the, you know, how water runs up and down a hill, whatever, all these details. Yeah, yeah, I did do a great deal of, um, of research, of course. The cube is completely um, imagined, however, uh, but it's not, yeah, but it's not, you know, um, given, given uh, you know, prison technology and, and whatnot, it's not, uh, it's not, so far from reality, probably. Um, I did speak with, uh, you know, formerly incarcerated individuals in the U.S., of course, um, including uh, uh, the Move family, um, who had spent over 40 years in, in prison, and most of them, uh, you know, were released um, toward the end of me writing this book. So I, you know, I spoke to them about um, conditions. Uh, it, a lot of them were held in solitary confinement. And of course, you know, I, I read a lot um, from the, the writings of Mumia Abu Jamal, Ahmed Sadat, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of prisoners, um, uh, interviews. And, and uh, so, um, so I researched that aspect as well as, um, you know, details like what flora would I expect to see at a particular season in this particular region of Palestine? Um, so those details were were highly researched as well. Um, there's a there's a 
passage in the book after Nahid gets married and she's kind of sitting on the balcony and she's, you know, she talks about, you know, what's going to appear next in the coming months and whatnot. Um, so that, you know, that, that entailed, you know, going through some botanical um, digests and things like that. Um, and also the conditions in Kuwait um, during the Iraqi occupation. I mean, I was born in Kuwait and so I'm, I'm very familiar with the country, um, but I wasn't there doing, during the Iraqi invasion. My, my whole family was. Um, so it was, you know, I could speak to them and, uh, and, and you know, get it, details like the, you know, the bread lines and people, um, uh, and actually some women I knew who, who did kind of break curfew and roam the streets and, <laughs> um, and dared to, you know, to be out and kind of used the, um, the public auntie, you know, uh, persona to get through checkpoints, you know, um, because no matter what, even under conditions of, you know, uh, of violence and conflict, they, you know, there's still deference to um, a, a matriarch in, in the Abaya and uh, with soldiers and, you know, uh, so that, you know, the, all of that, I, I did a lot of research and, but much of it was imagined also. I mean, especially the parts of um, the, uh, um, the resistance activities that happened. I mean, it's very unconventional stuff that has never happened in Palestine uh, or anywhere that I know of. So that was imagined. So that was invented, actually. Um, yes, but not the actual methodologies. Those actually are ancient. Um, oh. uh, so I did have to, I, I researched a lot of ancient warfare and a lot of ancient um, devices and weaponries and things like that. Right. By the way, I think the dog, I'm sorry that my dogs are going to bark like mad because I see my daughter coming into the door. <laughs> no. <laughs> There's well, three of them in the house now. <laughs> well, I'm sure nobody minds. You can invite them in if you like. They can, uh, they can join us. <laughs> um, well, it seemed also to me. Um, well, actually, you do. You acknowledge so many dogs in your acknowledgments, so it's uh, quite fitting that we should hear them. But I was actually seriously going to say that uh, your acknowledgments made me feel that this was somehow very much a communal uh, effort. This book. I mean, there are so many acknowledgments, and they're so specific, and they're so warm. Um, and everybody has a function, and and so I guess people were really important to you. I mean, have people always been important to you while you're writing, or is this a specific thing for this book? Um, you mean the 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 people in the acknowledgement, or sorry? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, um, you know, of of course. I mean, uh, um, I mean that's. That's what you do as a writer, right? You're you're um, you're an observer of people. You're a lover of people, of of life, and um, and for me also of animals. You know, I I live uh, I live with a lot of animals in my house, and I'm very much um, I'm an I'm an introvert, and I love um, you know my 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 cave <laughs> with my animals. Yeah, but you're an introvert, an introvert who lets in a lot of people, clearly, um, right. and has, you know, very productive relationships with them. So one of the really uh, beautiful aspects of the book, I think, is the way that you uh, worked with with Nahar's uh, se sexuality or her her sense of of herself as a woman, going from. Um, a sort of eager anticipation and delight in to sort of dreadful experiences. Um, and then in the end to what happens when she actually falls in love. And I thought that was tremendously um, sensitively and subtly done. And, and there's one sentence where she says, um, no one had ever kissed me with such love. And it occurred to me that happiness can reach such depths that it becomes something akin to grief. Um, and of course, we have an Arabic word for that, shajan, yeah. which I've never found anywhere else. But yeah, tell me, tell me about that. Um, 
Yeah, and you know, in Arabic, we have uh, there's there's many words for love um, in a way that you know it's extraordinary that you know in the English language, which is which is pretty expansive um, in many ways, but um, we have this one tiny word for for an emotion that um, is so varied and um, and and so. Uh, so expansive and, 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 but you know, you have to, you, we only have one word for it. <laughs> so, but we don't have a word for like in Arabic. So I guess. Right. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Um, but yeah, like I touched on this um, a bit earlier um, regarding, you know, the, the dealing with sexuality in this book. Um, and that's, that's a constant thread. And also, um, uh, you know, there, there, there are at least, well, there are at least three gay men in this story, uh, in the ways in which their lives unfold. I mean, they're tangential, um, in many ways to the main story, but they're woven into the narrative. Um, and it, and it goes, um, it goes hand in hand with, you know, the, the, the traumatic sexuality and the redemptive sexuality um, that, uh, that Nahid experiences. Yeah. Well, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's all, and it, it um, and she has this, this, a couple of big speeches where she actually, um, like, finds her voice and finds her philosophy almost through, um, well, through accepting of other people's uh, sexuality or, 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 or preferences. So, um, yeah. yeah. Finally, finally, uh, this sounds a little frivolous, but did you did you have fun writing like how bad Nahr could be? Um, you know, the sort of, I mean, she's, she's really, she's waging asymmetrical warfare all the time, mm -hmm. whether she's in the cube or whether she's in Palestine and she just uses what she can, whether it's her menstrual blood or, um, or whatever, or there's this wonderful thing where they um, we steal their cars all the time and mix up their plates, and and so and I, I just felt there was a, a, a sort of joy, joy de vivre. There was a joyousness um, in the writing of these bits where she's, you know, yeah. Yeah. being a bad girl. So yes, it was um, it was a joy to to write Nahir. Um, uh, she. Um, I didn't kind of, I didn't want it to end really with her. She was my friend. I fell in love with her. Um, and she, you know, she, she's, she's an underdog. She was born, she wasn't supposed to be, uh, you know, who she is. She, you know, she's, she's a Palestinian. She's discriminated against. She's the daughter of refugees. She's, uh, you know, she, she's crap in school. She doesn't, she doesn't, she barely finishes high school. Um, but with everything she does, I mean, in, in the smallest things, you know, in, in, uh, in, in, in school, as, as, a, as a school girl in middle school, she has this girl gang and she beats people up who mess with her brother, for example. Um, she terrorizes, you know, anybody who crosses her. She holds a grudge. Um, when she's older, you know, there's a scene where she's, um, she's, be, she's being raped and, uh, and, and she's, of course, um, being terrorized by it. But in the midst of all that, she is, um, she steals the man's bank card and she's plotting ways to get revenge on him by withdrawing all his money. Um, and she is able to do that. And, uh, and, and, you know, and then, you know, and she's confronted later about her, you know, reputation, as you know, you know, a girl's reputation is a, is a big deal in our world and whatnot, and she she remains defiant about that. Um, and uh, so, th the story is very much um, part of not a story is is very much about um, confronting shame and living without apology um, in a world that uh, is is quite cruel. Um, it's cruel, that's cruel to Palestinians and it's especially cruel to women. Um, but she, 
she finds a way to triumph in nearly every um, every every circumstance that she that she's in, and that's one of the reasons that Bilal falls in love with her. Yes. Even you know, in an Israeli courtroom, you know, she's being tried for terrorism, and you know, there's she kind of she does some things where she colonizes the colonizer space of authority. Yeah, no, she's uh, she's endlessly surprising, and she's funny, and she's uh, sassy. And uh, she's she's a, she's a great character. So um, I hope that we've um, we've done enough to interest you, and um, that you can see that this is a book that is very very well worth reading, and you're going to really really enjoy it. And I would urge you to buy it from the um, Edinburgh Book Festival site because that then goes into this whole endeavor that we're all part of. So Susan Abulhawa, it was a great pleasure reading your book and a great pleasure talking to you. And, um, and I wish you very well indeed. And it was wonderful being here for the Edinburgh Festival of Literature, even though it was virtual. Thank you, Adaf. And it's always a joy to, to speak with you. Um, and yes, I do wish we could have been there in person, um, but it's, uh, it's, it's fabulous to, to still be able to, to do this across the oceans. And um, thank you to the festival for, uh, for including me, for including Nahed. Um, and I wanna reiterate what uh, Adaf just said about um, purchasing books, um, whether it's mine or anyone else's um, from, from the festival itself. Uh, because it's you know this uh, uh, the world of, of of literature and literature festivals is so important to sustain um, rather than you know getting books from big corporations that shall not be named. 